All right, good morning, everybody, and um, welcome to the first talk of this uh, this year of the um, UAB Informatics Institute Power Talk Informatics Series. And um, I'm so happy to introduce today's speaker. Um, he, I see many of you here that know him well, and so he doesn't need any introduction. Um, one of the most prominent people right now in um, in informatics, or in, of all time in informatics. Mm -hmm. Um, I am proud to call myself an alum of his program, so very proud to have had him as a professor and mentor. And um, our director of our Informatics Institute, um, Jim Semino, unfortunately, he is not able to attend today. And he and uh, he and Dr. Hirsch also go way back. They were in the same fellowship at Harvard in informatics way back when, when informatics was new, and then um, have collaborated many times over the years. So he did record a quick video. Um, he just felt so strongly and felt so bad. So he felt that he recorded a video in which he, um, he introduces Dr. Hirsch personally. So I'm just gonna show that video really quickly. Oops. Okay. Do I need to stop sharing my screen? Um, no, I think, it'll, I think it'll just come up. Yeah, I want you to go ahead and stop sharing so it makes the whole screen. Yeah, sure, that's fine. Can everybody see? Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Jim Semino, director of the Informatics Institute at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, a sponsor of these Power Talk seminars. And it's my pleasure to welcome today Dr. William Hirsch from Oregon Health and Sciences University, where he is professor and chair of the Department of Medical Informatics and Clinical Epidemiology. Bill got his bachelor's degree in biology at the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana and as MD at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He then did internship and residency in internal medicine at the University of Illinois Hospital. In 1987, he started a fellowship in medical informatics at Harvard, uh, working at Brigham and Women's Hospital to Bob Greenis at the same time that I was doing a fellowship in medical informatics at Harvard at Massachusetts General with Bob Greenis. And we had uh, occasion to work together on several projects. In 1990, Bill moved to OSU, Oregon Health Sciences, uh, Oregon Sciences University, now Oregon Health and Sciences University. Uh, and he has become world famous in his research in information retrieval related to health information and health literature. And also a uh, strong proponent of informatics education. And he was the founder of the American Medical Informatics Association's 10 by 10 educational project. He is board certified in clinical informatics and he is widely published. He has chapters in several editions of Ted Shortliff's uh, uh, informatics textbook uh, on information retrieval. And as co-editor of that book, I can say we were always very glad to have Bill's contribution, partly because he was always the first one to submit his chapter. Uh, he, he would submit them so early that by the time the book was ready for publication, uh, we would have to ask him to submit an, uh, an update to the chapters, and he always did that very gladly and promptly. Uh, and I was also glad because he has his own book on information retrieval and his own book on health informatics, uh, sort of in competition in some ways with uh, Ted Shortliff's book. So I was uh, always very um, happy to have his contributions. Uh, Bill is a fellow of the American College of Physicians and the American College of Medical Informatics and the American Medical Informatics Association, where I think he is a founding member. If not, he was almost a founding member. Uh, he uh, was on the board of directors for AMIA and also secretary of the board. And most recently, he's become an inaugural member or fellow of the International Academy of Health Sciences Informatics, uh, where he's currently the president. Uh, he and I have several papers together. Uh, first one was 1995, uh, was the Canon Group, which is a group of informaticians working on foundational representations for medical terminologies. And then he was a lead author uh, for uh, two papers uh, by uh, a wide number of authors, uh, me included, on caveats for the reuse of electronic health record information for research purposes. And if you are in that game, I highly recommend you check out those two papers because they have a lot of important lessons on what to look out for and how to address the shortcomings. So Bill has kindly agreed to speak today at our, our opening 
uh, seminar this, this semester. And his title of his talk is Translational Artificial Intelligence, The Need to Translate from Basic Science to Clinical Value. And I'm very glad to have him here. I'm very sorry that I won't hear this live because I have a, uh, another engagement. Um, but I look forward to hearing the recording. Bill's talks are always very easy going, you'll find, very easy to follow. You'll say, oh, I kind of know this stuff. And before you know it, he's tricked you into learning all kinds of new information that you'll then retain forever. So uh, welcome, Bill. Again, very sorry that I can't be there in person to welcome you, uh, uh, but I know you'll do a great job. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at AMIA in November. All right, uh, Jim, thanks for that wonderful introduction. And Bill, um, you can start sharing your screen again, then uh, take it away. Great. Um, <laughs> thank you, Jim, <laughs> virtually. Um, we do go way back. Um, Jim was actually a year ahead of me in the NLM fellowship, so he was one of the kind of senior uh, people. And um, um, and there's a number of others, you know, who are now <laughs> old timers in the field who were fellows um, under Bob Greenis and Octo Barnett um, back then. So um, it's great to get that introduction, and I completely understand um, him uh, not being able to be here. Um, you know, those uh, issues arise. Uh, with our busy lives. So um, um, thank you, um, uh, Amy and others for inviting me to uh, give this talk. Um, it is an update actually of a talk I gave uh, not too long ago, but I, I think it's a real important topic. Um, and um, I, I, I think as you know, we, um, there's a lot of enthusiasm around AI, machine learning, um, and there should be, um, but we, we also, though, and I think this is where we bring in our informatics perspective, is that there needs to be clinical value. It needs to be beneficial to either patients or healthcare or research or whatever. Um, so basically, this talk is in three parts. Um, and um, actually, as Jim says, probably some of you, many of you will, some of the things I talked about in the beginning part, the kind of promise and, and some of the early results uh, will um, be familiar to you. Um, I'm also going to uh, actually spend some time on a systematic review th that was done, wh which I think is, is really good because it, it kind of gives us a, a perspective on where we are. Um, and then, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about my own uh, research. And uh, so the third part of the talk will focus on that. Um, I should mention, um, and I'll be happy to paste the link in the chat um, since I can't as easily do that right now. Um, that, that I've made, as I always do when I give talks, a PDF of the slides and all the references that I cite. Um, it's on my website. I actually tweeted it um, uh, uh, in response to the Twitter announcement of my talk. So you can find it there. There's, uh, you can go to my website um, and, and you can get these um, slides. Um, so um, may, maybe I'll start with a um, kind of one slide history of AI and machine learning and medicine. You know, obviously, there's a huge history. I don't know that one slide can do it justice, but I, I think there are some high points that we need to know, especially for some of you who are newer to the field. Um, I came into the informatics field at the end of the kind of first era of AI when people like Ted Shortlip, um, the systems they had developed, really didn't quite cut it. I mean, it was great research. It was great work. The technology of the time was much more primitive than we have now that were not the kinds of data sources. And so that initial uh, uh, foray into AI really didn't um, accomplish um, a whole lot. Um, but AI has been um, a major activity in clinical informatics um, really since the beginning, uh, back in the 1960s. And so the first generation of AI was in the 20th century. Um, and the goal there um, was to try to create these handcrafted knowledge bases and then systems that would operate on those knowledge bases. Um, and, um, but as I just said, the computers lack the data, they lack the processing power, they lack the GUIs and they lack the internet. And so um, really never had much of an impact in medicine, although we learned a lot and some of those lessons are actually still important today. This led to the so-called AI winter, which was about when I entered the field in the late 1980s and led me to kind of focus on information retrieval as opposed to AI and actually people like Jim Samito to focus on terminology. Um, so we kind of forgot about AI. We stopped even using the term. 
Um, and then all of a sudden, um, probably within the last decade or so, we've seen this resurgence um, driven um, mainly by advances in machine learning, um, deep learning, neural networks, um, those things. Um, and of course, we have plentiful data. We have plentiful computer power. We've got networks. So it's a whole different world now. And we can do a lot more. Um, there are, so you may have your favorite overviews, the, the book by Eric Topol, the report by the National Academy of Medicine, a review article earlier this year by Raj Prakar um, are good overviews. But despite all of what we've done in AI and machine learning in modern times, um, there's still modest impact. Um, I was had a routine visit with my primary care physician and she actually does a great job of integrating uh, the clinical visit with the EHR, um, but there really wasn't any machine learning taking place in um, the visit that I saw my physician for the other day. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the promise um, and, and some of the early results. Um, as you all know, probably the most success has been achieved in imaging. Um, there are um, great um, systems that have been developed that can diagnose diabetic retinopathy, um, the histology of cancer and metastases and pathology slides, uh, chest X-ray findings like tuberculosis and pneumonia, and skin cancer. Um, uh, um, uh, prediction. And so um, th there are systems that work in the lab, I, I put that in quotes, um, because they're not in general practice yet, um, that um, are quite accurate, as accurate as physicians in diagnosing these um, conditions. And there's been a systematic review, not the one I'll talk about, but one that looked in 2019 at all the existing um, imaging applications. And there was a state-of-the-art paper last year from Estiva, who's uh, been one of the leaders in this area. Um, there's other forms of pattern recognition that have uh, uh, been quite effective. Um, age and sex determination, um, by, by actually looking into the retina, things that we as humans can't see, um, but predicting um, age, um, predicting biological sex, um, uh, uh, interpreting cardiac arrhythmias, um, interpreting EKGs um, better than um, conventional algorithms, um, detecting hyperkalemia, uh, an important uh, complication that we as physicians need to be aware of, um, and early diagnosis of things like congestive heart failure. Um, also sounds, um, detecting pathological uh, breath sounds has also been uh, something that's been accomplished. Um, I won't go into every last uh, study here, but um, also taking this, um, another area has been clinical prediction, predicting length of stay, um, complications, readmissions, uh, diagnoses. Um, actually, I meant to say the, the last slide had age and sex determination from EKGs, but all, also from retinal images uh, has been another one. Um, and, um, and also applying in areas such as COVID-19. These predictive models are very accurate, um, using, usually using machine learning, uh, oftentimes deep learning, and um, clearly there's a lot of potential for impacting clinical practice. Um, another important area has been assisting humans. Um, uh, we know that one of the biggest downsides of electronic health records has been the time, the, the, the way they slow down physicians, nurses, and others entering data. So there are both research systems and some of the commercial companies like um, uh, um, Dragon, the, the, um, the uh, Nuance, the company that's now been acquired by Microsoft in, in part for its medical abilities, um, how, assisting pathologists, um, uh, learning uh, clinical alerts, um, assisting dermatologists. So um, another big potential area for machine learning is, is helping physicians, everything from taking the dialogue between the patient and physician and turning it into notes in the chart um, to assisting pathologists, radiologists, dermatologists, et cetera. Um, more on, on radiologists um, uh, and, and also uh, chart abstraction, the second top level bullet there. Um, is another thing uh, humans spend a lot of time doing. So helping physicians and others extract information from charts and um, um, I, identifying, um, trying to identify alerts that are more bothersome than useful in clinical care. 
So how um, effective are these interventions? There was a systematic review published last year. I, um, it didn't seem to get what I thought would be the prominence that it, it should have. Um, in NPG, NPJ Digital Medicine, that's one of the nature offshoot journals. Um, it's a group from China. I, I've actually had email contact with them because um, I actually found um, a few uh, minor errors in the report. But I think it's really important to do these things. How, how um, looking at the entire landscape of um, AI prediction tools, what is their clinical impact? What is their quality? And particularly when it's done in randomized controlled trials, um, as those of us who are in medicine know, um, the most uh, the highest quality evidence comes from randomized controlled trials where we actually um, compare the use of these tools with not using them and seeing um, what impacts they have on patient outcomes. Um, the review uh, uh, looked at all of the clinical prediction tools and it grouped them into three categories. Um, and by the way, the link is here and it's open access, so it's very easy to get. Um, there's they what they call traditional statistical tools, um, mostly things like uh, regression, uh, linear regression, logistic regression. Um, a second category of machine learning, which includes all aspects of machine learning except deep learning, because um, deep learning and neural networks are not the only kind of machine learning. So other kinds of machine learning and then deep learning. Um, interestingly enough, and not surprisingly, if you know about these kinds of tools, the um, um, traditional statistical and machine learning tools focused on the whole spectrum of activities, um, assisting treatment decisions, assisting diagnosis and risk stratification. Whereas the deep learning, at least the, the studies that have been done with randomized controlled trials, focus on assistive diagnosis and, and really mainly imaging. And that's, um, as I said a few slides back, that's the area where, um, uh, this, where machine learning, deep learning has had the most effect is with uh, imaging. So um, this is a, a figure that you see in all um, systematic reviews. Um, maybe some of you have done systematic reviews. I, I actually have done a couple uh, over the years in areas like telemedicine and health information exchange. But you do this very broad literature search, and then you winnow it down to things like if you're doing a, a study of patient impact, things like randomized control trials. You could do the same thing on um, uh, um, anti uh, um, hyperlipidemia drugs. Uh, in fact, um, a, a colleague of mine uh, down the hall in my office is, is that he's done a number of systematic reviews. So the, the methodology is the same. So, you know, there's 26,000 uh, they identified. Um, they have a very broad search strategy, articles related to predictive tools, AI, machine learning. Um, and then they winnow it down to 65 randomized controlled trials from 63 articles and uh, um, uh, also uh, uh, some relevant observational validation studies. Um, so we go from this huge um, uh, uh, corpus of literature down to 65 trials, which, which actually, if you think about it, is not a lot. I, I mean, machine learning has, and AI have so many applications in medicine, yet only as of 2021, 65 trials had been done. Um, and so they looked at these trials that you may not be able to read well the table that I've copied and pasted from the article, but you can go look at the article itself. Um, they looked at the characteristics of these trials. Um, three fifths of them had positive results. That's put another way, um, two fifths of them had negative results. They did not show a uh, clinical benefit. Um, the trials were done, not surprisingly, on a, a variety of different disease categories. They, they lumped them into cancer, other chronic disease, acute disease, and primary care. Um, the most studies have been done with the traditional statistical tools like regression and things, probably a function of time since machine learning is newer and deep learning is newer still, um, so there have been fewer studies. Um, and they looked at the function that these predictive tools did. The most common use was for assisting treatment decisions, um, followed by assisting diagnosis, followed by risk stratification. Um, one of the things that comes up when you do a systematic review is part of the review is actually looking for bias in studies. Um, and um, many of these studies had issues with uh, what the systematic review people call risk of bias, meaning that they're 
are methodological um, attributes of these studies that potentially um, that, that are not as good as they should be, and they introduce the potentially potential that the outcome could be biased. Um, so for example, one third of these studies had no sample size estimation. Um, three fourths of them had no masking. Now mask, you know, masking or blinding can be challenging in some studies, you know, things like, for example, a randomized control trial of surgery. You can't blind the patient or the surgeon to the surgical procedure. Um, but the, these were open label studies. So the, the people using the uh, systems knew that they were using them, which maybe can't be avoided, but it is a potential risk of bias. Um, another um, uh, thing, the majority of these studies didn't use the, there's a, a, a um, reporting um, instrument called consort that's, that should be used with randomized controlled trials. Over half did not over half did not use an intent to treat analysis where you do the analysis based on the group that the patient is randomized into, as opposed to if they may cross over um, or uh, provide the study protocol beyond what was described in the methods section of the paper. Um, so one, one thing to remember going back up to the top of the slide that you know sometimes people say, well, there were 60% positive results or for, and 40% negative results, so that's good or not good. Um, the number of positive studies isn't necessarily an indication of uh, superiority of one method over another. Um, this, another table from the paper, just gets into a little bit more detail. Um, it uh, uh, reiterates, um, so for example, what kind of data do these um, uh, trials use? So again, not surprisingly, the, the traditional statistical and machine learning um, systems use clinical quantitative data, so structured data out of the EHR. Um, the deep learning studies tend to use images. Um, interestingly enough, very few of these studies make use of the text. Um, uh, many of us, myself included, are very interested in um, using the text in progress notes, discharge summaries, et cetera. Um, very, I, I think just one or two of these studies actually uh, did that. Um, the disease categories were varied. Um, the the deep learning studies were focused on mostly on cancer and mostly on cancer imaging. Um, the tool function varied by the type of tool used. Um, and, and the results were mixed. They were actually more positive for machine learning and deep learning. Um, but again, the numbers of studies is small and we can't just go by the number of positive studies. Um, some other interesting observations, um, the number of studies increasing over the years, which is a good thing. Um, and um, the rates of positivity were actually higher for uh, deep learning over machine learning over the traditional statistical methods. So although again, the number of studies is small. Um, th this gets into the kind of risk of bias that we see. Um, and we, we really need to hold our community to good randomized controlled trial methods if we're um, going to publish these randomized controlled trials and make a case that we should be using this AI tool or that AI tool in clinical practice. And um, um, some of the things I've already mentioned, the suboptimal use of the consort statement, which actually has been updated. There's a consort AI statement that is specific to AI um, sample size pre-estimation, randomization, intent to treat analysis and so forth. If you're interested in those things, you can delve into this uh, paper. Um, I just wanted, um, so the paper, um, you know, again, breaks the tools down. Um, I, I think it's very interesting to look, th this is a table from the paper. It's not particularly easy to read, which is actually one of my complaints of about this paper. Um, but the, as of 2021, there were only 11 randomized control trials that had been done looking at deep learning tools and nine of them focused on assisting endoscopy. Um, those of you who are not clinicians, endoscopy is where we stick those flexible tubes and um, various uh, orifices in the body. Um, these were mostly GI endoscopy, so either upper or lower GI endoscopy um, and uh, looking for things like, you know, helping detect polyps that could be cancerous or could indicate a risk of cancer. Um, all of those studies actually had positive results. 
Um, and many of them actually come from uh, just, I think it's two or maybe three uh, research groups um, in China who do really good work, but it's not, you know, we don't know how generalizable that is. Um, and then the two other studies, one that was used for um, um, ambulance um, uh, um, uh, triage and then out of hospital cardiac arrest and um, then the one other one, oh, is in um, ophthalmology. So looking at images inside the eye, that study was negative too. Um, so what this means, it doesn't mean that deep learning has no role in medicine, but it means that we need to find the proper way to use deep learning in medicine and actually show that we can have positive benefits. So um, what conclusions um, do I have about this review? Um, I think AI predictive tools do still have great promise, um, but we, we don't yet have the comprehensive evidence that we need um, to uh, advocate for their use. Um, so the number of clinical trials assessing clinical benefit of AI is still small. Um, the majority of the trials published so far have intermediate or high risk of bias. It, it doesn't mean that they're biased, but there are not, there were not methods used that would minimize um, the bias. Um, and that the trials of deep learning methods, despite all the, what I call basic science uh, studies in use of deep learning um, are mostly focused on endoscopic procedures, um, which is good for endoscopic procedures, but we need to look at more areas. There are a few other kind of minor issues with the review. Um, there was, um, and actually, uh, this is what I was mainly emailing with the authors about. Um, they um, they actually had a missing column in the paper in the print you know in the journal PDF paper uh, of the deep learning interventions, which makes it very difficult to interpret that table. Uh, they did send me a spreadsheet that had that table in it. I don't know if they ever updated the paper. Um, and then there was a, a study that wasn't there of a deep learning intervention, a randomized controlled trial, which highlights the challenge with static systematic reviews. Um, the day you publish them, they become out of date because new trials are coming down the pike. And I encourage these authors to um, uh, keep their um, uh, um, systematic review up to date, which groups like the Cochrane collaboration do. If you publish a systematic review with them, you actually also agree to keep it up to date. Um, the, um, some, of the data, some of the data is difficult to use. There's a supplementary table for it that has all the machine learning interventions. And um, it's a PDF that's spread across pages. It's just a very unusable thing. They, they did send me a, a spreadsheet with that. And I, you know, I encourage them to really publish that as their supplementary data and not a PDF printout of, of a uh, table. Um, and then um, there was another study that I thought should be there that wasn't, but it may have been a, a traditional statistical, although they didn't publish a study. Uh, they didn't publish a table that had their traditional statistical um, uh, interventions. So, I mean, all in all, a, a very good review. Um, I, I hope they keep it up to date uh, because we, as informaticians, who are going to be implementing these uh, AI and machine learning systems in, in clinical settings uh, need to know how to um, um, need, need to know whether these things actually work or not. When clinical colleagues come to us and say, "I want to implement this tool in the in the GI clinic," um, well, you know, is there benefit um, and so forth. Um, Okay, so then, um, as I said, the third part of my talk, and, and I tried to leave some time for questions and discussion, I was interested to hear what the audience has to say. Um, um, applying, um, uh, my, so this is my work, it, it doesn't actually involve a lot of um, uh, machine learning, um, you could debate whether or not it's a AI, but um, um, anyways, it, it is pertinent to this topic, and so I um, thought I would tell you a little bit about that. So um, as with all informatics research, we, we need a, a good one or more good clinical use cases. Um, there's a lot of interest these days in cohort discovery, so identifying cohorts of patients, whether you want to follow them or recruit them for clinical trials. Um, there's a lot of tools that have been developed um, that, that are good, although not great. Um, and then another focus, which, which actually it resulted from people coming to my group at OHSU, um, trying to diagnose people who might have rare diseases, which often go undiagnosed. 
um, or go undiagnosed for a long time. And um, because I work in information retrieval, um, part, part of the process applies information retrieval to this data. And Jim Semino mentioned my book um, when it was published a couple of years ago. Um, I took this picture, or actually my wife took this picture um, of me um, holding both uh, print and um, uh, electronic versions, which is, I don't know if uh, your institution subscribes to Springer Link, uh, but if it does, you can go download this and all the other Springer informatics books. Um, and um, okay, then, um, so what data did we use for these use cases? Um, uh, OHSU, like I know the UAB Informatics Institute, has a research data warehouse of data that comes out of our, um, in the case of OHSU, EPIC uh, system. This is fully identifiable data. This is not de-identified data um, because our belief is that for this kind of research, we, we really need the real thing, which then creates a problem in that we can't share our data outside the institution. Um, but our IRB is comfortable with us doing this kind of research on fully identifiable uh, data in our data warehouse, even potentially my record because I'm a patient at OHSU. We, we try to minimize the research staff though going in and looking at the patient data, although we have the IRB approval to do so, and sometimes we do need to do so. Um, this work has been funded by grants, uh, mainly um, an R01 from the National Library of Medicine, but um, for these rare diseases, um, th there's actually a lot of pharmaceutical companies that are interested um, in it because they've developed these drugs that um, are only um, uh, applicable to a small number of patients because they're rare diseases. Um, and so they're interested in potentially diagnosing more patients. Um, this is not work that I do by myself. Um, some of you may know some of the people listed here, uh, Steve Bedrick and Aaron Cohen are informatics faculty members at OHSU. Uh, Steve Chamberlain is a, um, a postdoc in our group. Uh, and Tom DeLowry is a neighbor of mine who actually is uh, um, OHSU's expert in acute intermittent porphyria, uh, which is the disease that we were funded by Al Nylon to study. And I'll talk a little bit about that study, including, spoiler alert, a negative result from the outcome, but um, we'll get into that. Um, I'm only going to talk briefly about the cohort discovery work because that's a work in progress. We actually had an initial um, R01 and um, we had some initial studies, but we're, um, um, there, there is, we, we spent five years learning of a number of challenges of this uh, kind of work, trying to do work with large quantities of clinical data. But um, we um, obtained a collection of 100,000 patient records, the complete records out of the research data warehouse, which came from the original EPIC data at OHSU. And we published on the results, uh, on the methods and the results of, of the initial work with that data. Um, we then um, got the R01 renewed. Um, it was original collaboration with Mayo Clinic and OHSU, and we've added UT Houston. Um, and we're um, updating our data systems and methods. One of the complaints of the reviewers of the renewal was that, you know, how can you generalize your results across uh, institutions when you can't um, copy, uh, you know, you can't share your data? Um, and um, we can't share our data. Um, th there's no way that any of our institutions would let us. Uh, there's no way OHSU would let me send 100,000 patient records to Mayo or UT Houston or UAB or whoever. Um, but so our, our response, which the reviewers seem to buy, is that we will standardize everything else. Um, and of course, there's a nice standard now for the format, namely OMOP, the Observational Medical Outcomes Partnership, which um, allows, uh, which gets the clinical data into a standardized format um, and um, standardize the terminology and so forth. And of course, we'll, any tools we develop will open source um, and, and you know, we'll describe our methods. So we're basically, uh, we'll be sharing everything except the actual data. And then institutions, if they want to do this kind of work, will need to load their own data um, and then uh, develop their, you know, build their own models and see what results they get. Um, but you know there are major challenges to this kind of work. One is that you know even though we're moving towards more standardized uh, EHR data, um, the records are still heterogeneous. A problem that we we just recently have come upon is that um, uh, different 
instances of epics use different and the institutions that run them use different names for notes um, and um, you know part part of our methods involve processing the text in notes um, there actually is a standardized ontology for notes in loink that we're going to use but we'll have to map the, what our systems use um, but you know this just goes to show how data standardization and interoperability are important uh, but also challenging to achieve and then the whole issue of privacy concerns um, my earlier work in information retrieval looked at um, journal articles medline abstracts textbooks there there are copyright issues but it's not nearly the kind of privacy concerns that you have with patient data and i think that's always going to be a, a challenge for this kind of work um so that, that's all I'm gonna say for that. And I'll finish up um, next several slides uh, talking about rare disease detection. This was a fun project. We had hoped, um, well, it's and it's really not over yet. We're actually even talking about expanding the study. So, um, so let, let me talk first about rare diseases. Um, th there are actually, there's probably more than 1200. It depends on which, how you define rare diseases, but there are many rare diseases out there that affect small numbers of patients. Um, uh, use, the usual standard definition is less than one in 200,000. And many of these diseases are underdiagnosed. Uh, there's a website, rarediseases.org. Many people have written about it, including uh, Dr. Melissa Handel, who's now at the University of Colorado. Um, and the uh, characteristics of these diseases is that primary care physicians don't really think of them um, which they really shouldn't because they're dealing with common diseases like diabetes and hypertension and all those things, us uh, general internists, or in my case, former general internists uh, um, look at. Um, so there's a disease, acute intermittent porphyria. If you're a physician, you probably learned about this in medical school. I certainly did. You know, I learned the genetic pathway and where the mutations are, you know, and then I promptly forgot about it. i never seen a case of acute intermittent porphyria, which is also sometimes called acute hepatic porphyria. But th there's a, um, a metabolic pathway to synthesize the heme protein, which goes into hemoglobin, which goes into your red blood cells, which takes oxygen when you breathe in and distribute its, distributes it to the tissues. So um, heme is an important um, uh, protein in, um, human, actually all animal physiology. And um, there's a pathway and the enzymes, uh, there, there are enzymes or proteins in the pathway that assemble the heme molecule. And when there's a mutation in the um, gene for the enzyme protein, you don't get the proper production of the heme uh, molecule. And um, uh, for those of you who know genetics, there's variable penetrance, which means you can actually have the mutation, but it may not cause any symptoms in you. Um, the incidence of acute intermittent porphyria is one per 100,000 in the population generally. And it's another one of these diseases that often go undiagnosed for a long time. But the symptoms are significant. And if you've ever taken care of a patient with acute intermittent porphyria, um, they have significant morbidity. Um, they have so-called neurovisceral symptoms that include abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, and psychiatric changes. Th these are all fairly common symptoms um, that are present in so many diseases. So that's another reason why people don't think of acute intermittent porphyria, um, although it is rare. Um, and uh, the people who have the, and the symptoms are, are acute and intermittent, and, and people get real, really debilitated by this condition. Um, Ironically, the, the disease is diagnosed by a relatively inexpensive urine test. Uh, there's a chemical porphobilinogen, which back at, since the um, heme pathway gets backed up because of the uh, genetic defect, this porphobilinogen builds up and then spills into the urine. So it's actually, it's a $70 test to actually diagnose it. Um, you, you can also do the genetic uh, uh, test, although again, with the variable penetrance, just because you have the gene doesn't mean you actually have the disease. And then what really changed things that what, what gives companies like El Nylam the incentive to try to find more patients who have this is that there's a new highly effective and um, as with most diseases, most treatments for rare diseases, um, highly expensive treatment. There's a, an RNA silencing molecule called Givoseran. 
Um, there was a study, a uh, randomized control trial in the New England Journal of Medicine. It really changes the quality of life for these patients. So yes, it's an expensive drug, um, but it, it, if you do have acute intermittent porphyria, um, this drug can potentially change your life. So um, it's worth trying to find um, more patients with it. Um, and we can debate um, the economics of, of drug pricing in a different um, uh, discussion, but, but this just goes to show that these drugs can be very effective. Um, so the question that motivated l Nylam to come to our group is, can we detect rare diseases um, earlier using population-based techniques, basically, using EHR data? Um, so we took the data set we had from the previous study, the the cohort discovery one, we added 100,000 more patients. So now we have 200,000 patients. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we would have all patients who might have uh, acute intermittent porphyria. So we, we found uh, another 5,571 patients who had the string P-O-R-P-H somewhere in their record. Um, so that gave us about 205,000 patients. Um, so then, um, and we thought we would develop a machine learning algorithm. And this is mainly the work of Aaron Cohen, uh, who some of you from AMIA uh, know who Aaron is. And um, we, um, we found actually, so of these 205,000 patients, um, 47 had the ICD-10 CM code E80.21, which is acute intermittent porphyria. Um, and then we manually reviewed, we actually had a medical student who wanted to work on a project as all of our medical students do at OHSU. And, and her task was to review these 47 patients and see how many of them truly had acute intermittent porphyria. Um, and we came up with 30. Now, for those of you who know machine learning, this is a highly imbalanced set of 200 5,000 records, only 30 of which are positive. Um, but all of the rest of the patients were the negative training cases, and we applied the machine learning. And if someone asks me a real detailed question about machine learning, I may have to refer you to Aaron Cohen. I've certainly learned about it, but he's, he's the real expert in machine learning. Um, and so um, we parsed the record into features and um, sorted them by... Um, uh, frequency of how they appeared. Um, and um, then we did a univariate feature analysis. So um, we, we looked at um, uh, features um, that would go into our machine learning model. Now, there are some other um, things that we wanted to keep out of the model. So we didn't just do this kind of blindly. So for example, the word DeLowry, I mentioned our expert, shows up because he, he's the provider at OHSU that follows all these patients. Um, we, we got the drug cimetidine. It actually turns out that there actually was a, a case report of cimetidine providing benefit in acute intermittent porphyria. But we, we wanted to be, we wanted to choose features or, or terms um, that were generic and, and would be used in other places. So we trained on the full data set. Um, Aaron used, tried a bunch of different uh, machine learning methods. And he found to get the best predictive performance um, with uh, support vector machines using radio basis function uh, kernels. And, um, and then we applied the training model back to the full data set to rank patients um, by, how, by the margin distance, by how close they were to the positive cases. So this basically gave us all of the other patients uh, that we could look at to see if they may indeed have acute intermittent porphyria and potentially test them. Um, and um, we identified, if you look in the lower, so, you know, we looked at all the patients. Um, we, um, we focused on the ones that did not have any mention of porp. There, there were also those that did have mention. We did some additional work with them, but our goal was to try to find patients who may have acute intermittent porphyria that had never been considered. Um, and we looked at 100 patients. We, we probably could have kept going down the list, but time was limited. And we actually identified 22 patients who had the classic symptoms of acute intermittent porphyria, but had never um, been even tested, uh, had never even been considered. Um, so those are the patients that we, I'll, I'll get to on the next slide, we did a clinical validation study. In, in terms of the other patients who had the symptoms, there, there were patients with things like cancer pain, uh, psychiatric diagnoses, and so forth, that, that did have mention of, of 
PORF. Well, actually, even some of the ones in the um, without mention of PORF, actually, um, those were some of the diagnoses. So other kinds of pain, um, other kinds of psychiatric diagnosis. So um, we actually decided that um, kind of since I talk about this, I have to put my money where my mouth is or whatever that phrase is, um, to do a clinical study to actually see if we could see if any of these patients actually had acute intermittent porphyria and it would actually benefit them because they would be candidates for Javosaran, that new drug, which is actually covered by most insurance and Medicare. Um, so, um, so we set out to do the clinical study. Unfortunately, we set out to do the clinical study in late 2020. That, that was when the, the previous paper that uh, Aaron Cohen uh, and I had published. Um, it, it took us a long time to convince our IRB uh, to let us do this. And there also happened to be a COVID-19 pandemic. And this was before there were vaccines for COVID-19. Um, so we, we negotiated a lot with the IRB. They appropriately so wanted us to, um, to not just go to the patient, but to go to their primary care or other physician first. And then if the physician approved, then we could contact the patient. But our goal was to identify those 22 patients, the four likely 18 possibly, and test them to see if they may have acute intermittent porphyria. Um, they had the symptomatology, but no one had thought about it. Um, so um, this slide is a little busy, but, but basically, so we have those 22 patients, turned out that six of them were either deceased or had moved away from Oregon, so we couldn't figure out how to contact them. Um, Twelve were receiving their care at OHSU. Um, uh, four um, uh, had transferred their care um, outside OHSU. So, um, and then within OHSU, some had primary care physicians, others were seen by specialists within OHSU. And so we asked the clinicians, um, uh, whether they would let us contact the patient. Three of the physicians said no, um, the rest said yes. And so then we contacted the patients. Uh, we, we tried email, we tried calling them. You know, this was at the height of the pandemic, but we, we got through to, I think about like 15 or so, and actually got seven, actually got more than seven people who agreed to come in and give a urine specimen. Um, but um, the um, um, other ones, um, uh, did not. And so we tested um, seven patients with uh, urine porphyrolipolinogen. It's not, a, even though it's a, an inexpensive test, it's not an easy one to do because the specimen has to be um, put on ice um, as soon as it's collected. Otherwise, the, the porphyrolipolinogen disintegrates. So, um, so they did need to come in. I mean, potentially we could have sent people out, um, but we didn't really have the resources to do that. And seven people did. And um, needless to say, the seven who came in had normal urine porphyrolipolinogen. So this is a negative study, but I can always put a positive spin on things. Um, I, I think this is an important. I, I think it's important to do these studies in the first place um, because you know we have a great algorithm, and it may be that if we test more people, which we're hoping to do in the longer run, we may find someone, um, and um, we may um, you know be able to get them on that drug that's uh, beneficial. Um, another challenge is, is, you know, for those of us who are informatics researchers who are not directly caring for these patients, how do we care for them? Um, the two-step approval process, it, which is a good thing because it does involve the physician and many of them were helpful in helping us contact their patients, um, but it does add complexity. Um, another issue is that rare diseases are rare. Um, so we already had um, um, a small number of people diagnosed. And the question is, you know, it, when it, the incidence is two per 100,000 people, um, wh where we're gonna find more people who indeed have the condition. Um, and then this doesn't apply to our study, but um, uh, testing may be expensive or even harmful if there needs to be a biopsy or, or even a blood test is um, not really harmful, but it's more expensive, it's invasive and so forth. Um, but still, we did identify people who were at least candidates for um, testing uh, for urine uh, porphobolinogen, but we didn't identify any positive cases. Um, so um, what do we conclude? Um, and, um, and then I'll be happy to, I'll stop sharing and happy to have some discussion. So as in all of medicine, um, 
we do things in the basic science labs, whether it's machine learning or a tissue culture study or whatever, um, but they, they must achieve clinical validation. And many machine learning models, our, our literature, including our informatics journal is filled with papers um, that have achieved what I would call basic science success. And now we need to demonstrate the clinical value. Um, and then since I know many in the audience are informatics researchers or students or fellows who aspire to become informatics researchers, I, I think this is probably one of the most opportune uh, areas for informatics uh, going forward of, of doing these clinical studies, collaborating with clinicians and seeing how our um, machine learning and AI tools can make a difference. So um, I wanna thank you all. Um, you know, again, um, you can get these slides, which uh, has my email, my website, my blog, uh, my Twitter feed, and I'm happy to have any further discussion. So I'm going to stop sharing here and i um, happy to uh, answer any questions. It looks like there are questions in the chat. Um, let me let me just uh, ask uh, Amy if uh, she would prefer me to start there. Yeah, that, that we've had some really great questions. Thank you, everybody, for posting them. Um, you can either read them or I could read them for you. Yeah. It's like you have no, access I'll, to them. Sure. No, I'll go down the list. Really great um, questions. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is always the best part of giving a talk. I, I, I actually was hoping I would get through a little faster. But um, anyways, OK, so the, there's the, the link to the PDF um, that Amy posted. Uh, so from Rahul Sharma, how do we do a standardized tool trial? Is there any authority I connect can connect to. Um, I'm not actually uh, sure what you mean by standardized tool. Um, I, um, I, yeah, I, I think I mean, he means that um, it's so easy to do a drug trial. There's this clear channel mm, for how you do that. Right. How would we do the same with tools? Sure, gotcha. Okay, yeah. Um, so, um, you know, the, there are, you know, I mentioned the consort statement, you know, which is if you do like a drug trial, you're supposed to make sure your paper covers the data elements in the consort statement. And, the, and that statement is there's now a consort AI statement that does the same thing with an AI perspective. Um, you know, randomized control trials are, are not easy to do. I mean, you, you have to get IRB approval. You have to go out and um, uh, um, recruit patients and, and you need to randomize them and, and things like that. It's not easy. I mean, the, certainly the best thing to do is to collaborate with someone who has experience in doing uh, those kinds of trials. Um, I, I would actually probably your institute in terms of who you should connect to. Um, I imagine there's people that can can help you. Um, how um, how deep learning can help your research? Um, well, I. Um, if I'm understanding this question correctly, um, you know, how can deep learning help medicine? And, um, um, you know, I, I, I think it's important to do the basic science studies of machine learning to show that your learning algorithm can diagnose diabetic retinopathy or pneumonia or predict uh, uh, patient, uh, out, poor patient outcomes, things like that. Um, and you need to do that initially in a kind of um, uh, basic science lab kind of way. Um, but then, you know, we need, um, can you actually take a, a, a machine learning algorithm that can read chest x-rays and um, does it actually, do you, does it actually work in a clinical setting where the world is not quite as perfect as in, in basic science kinds of studies with clean data sets and all that. So um, they um, um, have to, um, um, uh, you, you know, we, we need to test them further. Another issue with, with imaging studies is there are lots of different imaging charge, imaging equipment, different vendors and so forth, which the imaging people admit that we need to deal with because um, different vendors, imaging equipment might take pictures slightly differently. Um, I'll keep going. Oh, Dude, there was another so, question, oh, I think, uh, about that one that- um, Okay, sure. sure. Okay. Um, I, I'm happy to jump to it, or you just want me to keep going down the list? Uh, I'll just read it out. Do certain EHR companies hinder help in machine learning? Could you give an yeah. example where an EHR happened to be better than others? Yeah, um, no, that, that is, that's a very important question. I think, um, 
you, you know, and I mean, in some ways it shouldn't even matter because, but it does, and I'll, I'll address that in a second. But, you know, what we're interested in is the data, you know, of course, then the EHR is the vehicle to collect the data. Um, I, I think the EHR companies are going to have to um, help us with this. And, and I mean, I, um, I, I've seen positive signs from some of the vendors, including Epic, um, that they're interested. But, but what's really important are things like data standardization so um, things like fire um, and the, the new regulations from the 21st century cures rule um, uh, so i don't know that any one ehr is better than another i don't know that anyone's actually looked at that but but it is important that we partner with the hr vendors and they partner with us um, and that they recognize it's important for their um, tools to um, to be able to assist with this kind of research um, Next uh, question, Ida. Oh, Ida, great to see you. <laughs> I see your, your still picture on the top of my screen. There you are. Um, uh, did the negative results lead you to review and or revise the algorithm? Um, they haven't yet, but certainly that's a question because you know people say, well, why didn't you use a deep learning algorithm? Um, Aaron actually tried um, deep learning, but he actually got better results with the support vector machine. Now, there's been advances in deep learning since um, we did that work. So we probably need to go back. We're, we're actually hoping um, the, 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 um, the vendor, El Nylam, is actually interested potentially in, in additional research, um, but we would obviously need the resources to do it. But, but certainly, I think we probably need to go back to the beginning um, and look at new um, um, algorithms, you know, update our data set, and um, and then uh, you know potentially and and we probably need to test more patients than just the seven who we convinced to to show up. Does that answer your question? Well, I was thinking more if there were characteristics of the seven or potentially more that you might get in the future that would lead you to change the algorithm. Yeah, because, um, they, because they were negative in terms of the yeah. disease, right? So you've got right, an right. example of negative. Of negative yeah, things. right, right. Well, yeah. So we don't we don't have a positive in the sense that that we diagnose them. Um, so, um, but I, you know, I think we do need to look at other algorithms. You know, we probably need to look at other data sets. Where there's actually another institution that um, uh, we're potentially going to collaborate with uh, to look at their data. So yeah, I I don't think this is the final word. And in fact, you know, one of the issues with publishing that small paper that there were reviewers who didn't want to publish that paper, you know, but I thought it was important to publish it to just show that we need to do this kind of work. But I don't think this is the end of the story, though. And that's why we published the paper as a brief communication and not as a full on paper. Um, but um, but yeah, I think there's a lot more work to be done. And I, I don't think what we did um, is, is the end of the story. Yeah. So I'll um, uh, Let's see. <laughs> also, um, um, just to yeah. just to do a check on time that we're at time. So I don't know if you're able okay. to stick around or if anybody else is able to stick around, but uh, feel free to leave if you need to, because we know that people have lots of things going on. Sure. I, I, yeah, Labor Day. I, I can I can stick around another uh, uh, maybe five or 10 minutes. Um, I'm actually giving another talk today to medical students about informatics. It's a talk I give each year. Um, wow, but yeah, I, I can stick around. Why, why don't you triage the questions to me and then uh, um, I'll, I'll, you just read them out and I'll, I'll try to answer them. Okay. Um, do the negative results mean that the learning tools were not beneficial or they have negative effect on humans? So I think whether that just means like neutral, like you didn't find anything or there was some kind of harm, I think is what the question is. Yeah. Well, I don't think there was any harm. Um, you know, many of these patients that have the symptoms of acute intermittent porphyria um, have these symptoms for a prolonged time and, and, um, and they're undiagnosed. And, you know, we didn't find any that were diagnosable. So we, we didn't do, I can't imagine anything we did here was particularly harmful. I suppose we made people venture out of their homes before there was a COVID vaccine. Um, but, um, um, you know, we, we were, we, we had a um, uh, protocol that we, you know, where we attain consent and we explained to patients exactly what we were doing. Um, and so I don't think there's any harm here. Now, if, if this were a different disease and might require, well, a blood test, you know, is not really that harmful, but you do have to get stuck or maybe something like a biopsy, then you're potentially getting into harm. 
Um, we didn't have that particular problem here. And I, um, I don't think we gave any patients any kind of false hope or anything, but the, those things need to be considered as we do these kinds of clinical trials. Um, what is the best way to, um, oh, how would you minimize bias with a deep learning model? Since you talked about, you know, look for sources of bias, how do we minimize yeah. bias? Well, yeah, there's all kinds of bias. I mean, first of all, there's bias in data, there's bias in algorithms, you know, th those are big issues for us in the informatics world. There, there's also the, the bias that that systematic review was looking at was just clinical trials methodology that wasn't as, um, um, good as it could be, um, you know, the, when, when you do a big multi-center randomized control trial and you adhere to the consort statement, you, you, you address everything like, um, concealment of allocation. So the, the, um, researchers don't know which groups the patients are randomized to. They may find out, uh, they, they will find out eventually, um, but that they don't influence the process, um, um, uh, intent to treat analysis. So people get analyzed in the groups in which they were randomized into. And it, it, it sometimes, especially like with um, drug trials, people cry, or with like surgery trials, people cross over. Um, so all of the kinds of things that are uh, important methodologically in randomized controlled trials, that we should be doing that too when we do these kinds of clinical trials. The study that I did wasn't really a randomized controlled trial. It was just really kind of more of a clinical validation study. Um, but, you know, for other kinds of things, you know, for example, for, um, um, you know, predicting deterioration in the hospital, you know, you, you need to validate your algorithm, um, but you also need to show that that algorithm actually can identify those people and give the clinical team an opportunity to make a difference. Otherwise, you're just predicting something that you can't do anything about. Uh, what is the best way to compare AI and machine learning with traditional methods like regression? Can we compare results and draw conclusions based yeah. on this? And also, well, he's citing an article, um, a systematic review shows no performance benefit um, over logistic re uh, regression clinical prediction yeah. models. Well, actually, I don't know that the systematic review shows that. I don't think they actually compared. The, these clinical studies tended to compare the use of AI versus the non-use of AI. That's what most of the clinical trials did. Um, but, you know, getting back to the first question, um, you know, if we have good data sets, we can compare any kind of um, uh, machine learning model, you know, regression, um, uh, neural networks, you know, deep networks, um, uh, uh, support vector machines, et cetera. So at the basic science phase, we can compare the different models and, and we can see which one seems to work best. Then presumably we would take the one that works best and then advance that into a clinical trial where we would put it as part of the care of the patient and the patients would be randomized to care with that tool versus care without that tool or with some other kind of um, best known practice kind of tool. Um, so, so you can, you know, with good data sets, you can compare different um, statistical machine learning, other kinds of models. Um, but then when you actually do a clinical trial, you want to see if, if it actually um, le leads to some aspect of better patient care, better patient outcomes, or lower costs or, or whatever. Um, just there was a, qu a quick comment about that previous uh, question and that paper that logistic logistic regression is a machine learning model. So yes, uh, yeah, it's not an either or necessarily. <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah. So you know, machine learning is you know the broad kind of, as the term says, you know, machines that learn and machines learn from you know when they calculate logistic regression, they learn you know when you uh, build a deep learning model and and everything in between. All right, uh, that's all the questions that we have. Any final questions? You can feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question um, or a comment. Oh, yeah, get get kudos, people uh, you know, clapping and... Um, mm -hmm. Oh, well, seeing none, um, hearing none, then um, thank you everybody for attending and uh, thank you for, for presenting this great presentation, very relevant and of interest uh, across a broad uh, cross-section of our community um, here, mm -hmm. informatics, translational, clinical, um, te technology. So um, well, have a good um, 
Labor Day weekend, everybody, and uh, keep keep doing all these wonderful things in research. Thanks very much, and, Bill. And, and I will look forward to seeing some of you at the AMIA meeting in November. So. Oh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we all have friendly faces here. And uh, yeah, see everybody there. Probably let, that's okay. how we, let, we network there. All right. Yeah. Take care, everybody. Great to see everyone. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. And uh, be sure to come for future uh, sessions. Next week, we have one at 9 and 10. We have like a double header next week. Uh, all right. Thanks, bye, Martin everybody. Hirsch. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.